Well, that's very good. That's the highest it's been since he's been in there. It's been below 90 most of the time in the 80s, even in the high 70s. So maybe, you know, we're just keep praying. <coughs> Why don't we just have prayer for him right now? Dear Lord Jesus, oh God, our trust, our confidence is in you, Savior. We're asking you, Lord, to touch Brother Bud's body, lift him up out of this virus condition. Oh God, touch the doctors and the nurses. Oh God, touch their minds and help them, Lord, to help him to get over this. Oh, Lamb of God, touch his assembly. <clears throat> the people there that have this virus also, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask you, amen. Uh, Brother Bud is his church. He's got, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's eight or ten of them that's got, got coronavirus in his church. And I think probably the reason for that is is because it's basically all one family. He's got a big family. Of course, they're together all the time. Brother Dennis White and Brother Dick Tubby are married to sisters. And their son, no, their daughter is married to well, Brother Jake's not kin to him. But then Jake and Emily have it, too. <laughs> and then they've got kids. And then Brother Bud's granddaughter is married to um, the white son. And then they've got how many kids, Ann? Four? One of them has it. And, uh, and Memo and Carmen Cano have got it. So <clears throat> those, you know, they, they're, those families are together all the time. And, of course, I don't know. They, they did go to the Tyler, the funeral, rather, uh, Jacoby. And there are several there they've, they've had, that have had it. And... Um, so anyway, it's kind of like a, it's kind of what, you know, it's kind of like what the world teaches on the devil. It's a ghost. You don't know where it's at or how, how it's working. And uh, so <clears throat> you don't know what you're fighting, really. Uh, <clears throat> but all of the people that have it are doing good. Uh, most of them are over it. Sister Carmen says she just feels real weak. I've heard that from a lot of people that after they've had it, it just takes them a long time to get over it. They just they they, they just seem like they have a lot of weakness. <clears throat> but anyway, it kind of spooky because it seems like it does affect the older people more than it does the younger people. So I remember Brother Bud when he first got it, he had it just a couple of days he was he was real sick, really kind of sick one day really sick he just didn't feel like doing anything or going anywhere felt like he was hurting all over aching felt like he's getting the flu and the next day he had that but he started feeling a bit better and by the next day he said I, I'm over it he said if it's all there is to this I don't I, it, he said it I don't see what the big deal is <laughs> but he sees what the big deal is right now so, but, you know, it affected him a lot worse than it affected any of the rest of them. Of course, he's the oldest of all of them. He's 74 years old, or fixing to be in the end. He, j he just had April, August 19th, he was 74. So, anyway, we just want to keep him in our prayers. And, uh, he's, he's a precious brother to me, I'll just tell you that. You'll live a lifetime, and you won't have very many people as close 
to you as Brother Bud and I are to one another. We're closer than brothers. He's the kind of guy that I could tell him anything. I can tell him whatever I feel when I'm wrong and when I'm down in the dumps, and I can tell you it will never go no further than Brother Bud. And he can and has many times done the same thing to me. That's when you know you've got a real friend, is when they'll stick with you no matter what you go through. And and they understand your ups and downs. We just have that kind of relationship, and it's precious to have. <clears throat> I'd hate to lose him. I get, I, I get used to having somebody, you know, sounding board, someone to talk to. Anyway, uh, uh, Sister Ann, hi. Who, who have you got with you? Brett, Brett, what's she say? Ray, Ray, what did you say your daughter-in-law's name was? Charity. Charity. Okay, Charity is Brett. Is Ray treating you all right? <laughs> all right. Well, we're awful glad to have y'all with us today. Appreciate you being here. Um, I, I thought I'm, I just might ask a question about uh, the subject I talked on recently about uh, harvest. Um, can somebody in here tell me what the main gist of what I was saying was? I'm just wondering if y'all got it. I may not have did a good, that good a job. Um, do, do, <clears throat> Well, hmm. I, I must not have did a very good job. you covered quite a bit as far as the way the harvests are considered, the latter rain, the early rain, how that's different in the Jewish calendar. Is it that part? What you covered a lot in relation to the harvest. Now he's talking about two harvests. The two harvest. Yeah, no, I'm talking about here recently I, I, I we had a Bible study on 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 harvest. I used the word harvest and I gave some scriptures on it. Let me just give you. Let me just give you a little re. Let me just restate a few things about it. Um, look in Joshua. Three fifteen. We'll start in the 14th verse where it says, And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as they that bear the Ark were coming to Jordan and their feet and the feet of the priest that bear the Ark were dipped into the brim of the water for Jordan, this is a very important part right here that's in parentheses. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. Um, <clears throat> let me explain that. This, this is talking about the harvest in the spring of the year, which is the 
um, the latter harvest, not the early harvest. And what happens, what happened with Jordan is all the snow of the winter in the springtime would melt and run down in the streams from the mountains and all empty out into Jordan and Jordan would overfill her banks. That happened every time before harvest. Every winter, when winter was over, Jordan would overfill her banks because of the snow melting and even the spring rains coming with it, and it would overflow the banks. One of the points I'm making here is that when they left the wilderness and went into the promised land, it was during time of harvest. And the type, the type there is of leaving, y'all always have heard the ministry preaching that we are in the wilderness in a fallen away church and it's going to require a restored church in the end of the Gentile world. It required the same thing in the end of the Jewish world. <clears throat> in fact, that's what that's a picture of. The uh, To go into the promised land, for us to enter into a restored church condition, that's what that's a picture of, going into the promised land out of the wilderness. It's during the time of harvest. Now what the picture of the overflowing the banks is, is that Babylon, Babylon will all run together and form a bee system. And it will overflow its banks at the time of harvest when God gets ready to harvest the end of this world, same way he har harvest the end of the Jewish world, the same thing happened. The Jews all came together and all of those different secular groups, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Elamites, Rhodians, Cretans, uh, you know, uh, Essians, all, all of those different secular groups joined together in fighting against the body of Christ and Christ being the Messiah, and they were adversary to it. But the ministry of that early church was able to take the people of God through across the spiritual type of Jordan without them getting any of the ideology of the, of the beast system of that day or Babylonian system of that day without them being hindered within that. That's a picture of them going across on dry shod ground. In other words, they didn't get any of the, the, the mud or the the that that let you know that 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 was uh, in the foundation on their sh feet or shoes because they were in type shod with the gospel of peace of Jesus Christ. So they didn't get any you know the ministry was able to take them through that period of time without them being affected by all the fa false ideology that was going on that was fighting against. It was a miracle that God got those people through that. And they went into the promised land, and of course they, they overcame the ites of the land and took the land. And that's what it'll take during, just like the early church did. In fact, I'll give you a scripture in, in uh, Revelations, the 8th chapter. Um, let me see here if I can find it. It's the second. It's the eighth verse, Revelations eight and eight. <clears throat> now this is the trumpets. The first trumpet sounded. Well, let me just go back to it because it maybe would just help you to know that what I'm saying about the second. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Now, y'all have heard me before on this third part. First off, hail and fire mingled with blood. It's just judgment. Judgment came from that first trumpet sound. 
and Jesus was the blower of that trumpet. And a third part of the trees were burned up. Y'all have heard me on the third part. This is not saying one third of the trees that existed there burned up, but there's only three times in the in history of man that God eternally judges. And he eternally judged in the end of the Jewish world with a divine order of God, which is what we're looking for in a restored church, which would be the second eternal judgment time and then during the thousand year millennial including the final white throne judgment after the thousand years will be the three times of eternal judgment so that's three three times which is one third one third and one third makes the whole of God judging everything and this third part of the trees he judged everything all trees were judged under Christ in the early church and and all green grass, that's flesh. They're, they're, see, all green grass. You know, he, Jesus judged the flesh in himself, which he judged and showed that, that uh, there, the, you cannot stand, the flesh cannot stand. It, it can't be saved. I'm talking about the works of the flesh or the Adamic nature, but it's the, it's the Christ-like nature that we're reborn of that has to be saved. So, verse 8 says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. If you remember, Jesus told his disciples, said, If you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, thou shalt say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea. Well, <clears throat> you know, of course he wasn't talking about taking a literal mountain and casting it into the sea. That's, per that's allegoric language. You know, it's a, there's a picture here that Jesus was getting across, and course you'd have to know some of the symbols of the Bible but mountains in the Bible prophetical speaking about mountains is talking about religion mountains and hills is religion the sea is flat it's how many y'all ever been in a boat out on the ocean if you ever been out on a boat in the ocean you can see where the sky meets the sea that's called the horizon and that's seven miles. The human eye, if you've got 20 20 vision, you can see seven miles if you're flat. That's how far you can see. You know, that's what I've told you about Jesus <laughs> coming in a cloud if you're further than seven miles off. And he comes 14 miles down the road. He's going to have to be pretty high in the sky if you're going to get to see him. And if he's a thousand miles off, you ain't going to see him, period especially if he's in the clouds. <laughs> anyway, I'll get off of that. <clears throat> but a mountain or a hill is something higher than the sea, and that's just symbolic in the Bible that uh, uh, you know, a hill or a high place or even a mountain has influence. Uh, religion has influence over people. I don't care what kind of religion it is. It has influence on people, and it's a rise of influence. The sea in the Bible, prophetically, is it's symbolic of the world. So an influence that's greater than worldly influence, which is religious influence, is depicted as being a, a mountain or a hill. Uh, or rise from the earth. You know, we're on ground here, I think we're 236 feet above sea level here at Little Rock, at least at the airport runway in threshold. I'm pretty sure that's when you're coming in and it's all clouds. You're, you have to know you're 236. If you, if you try to drop below 236 feet, you're going to be hitting the ground if you're in the clouds. So you need to make sure that you, you know what you're doing. Anyway, so when Jesus was telling the disciples, if you have 
faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say unto this mountain, Be thou cast into the sea. It was fulfilled right here in the second trumpet. The, first, the second angel sounded, it was a great mountain burning with fire. God was judging the religious system of that world back there. And it was cast into the sea. In other words, the influence that Judaism had over the Jewish world, the, the apostles and that ministry back there was able to dissolve that influence and cause it to go back into the sea as far as people's minds had no influence on people that had faith that Jesus was the Messiah and that they were serving him, that influence was done away with. It was just cast back into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. In other words, there was judgment on everyone. That third part back there, it'll happen down here, another third part, and another third part during the millennial. <clears throat> so... That, that, uh, that's a picture, I mean, you can add this to a picture of how that the priesthood with the ark carried the people across Jordan without them being affected by it. That the spiritual picture is, is somehow we got to get through this world not being affected by false doctrine and false religions. And it's going to come... Right now, right now, this United States of America, I said here recently, William Souter saw what's going on today through a telescope of time, seeing future many years away. Today, if you're spiritual at all, you can see without even a pair of glasses what's going on. This United States of America is changing rapidly, this United States of America is it's falling uh, uh, in righteousness. Uh, I I was just reading. I heard this the other day, and I so I looked it up, and I still don't know the exact amount of truth about it, but it's hard for me to believe the lowest figure that I could get of how many Americans are gay is 21%. One out of every five people. That is very hard for me to, it's hard for me to decipher that that could be true. I'm hoping that, you know, I've, I've read four or five different researches on it, and that's what I'm getting on it. In fact, some of them are saying as much as 26%. That's hard for me to believe, but, but morally, morally, this country is decaying rapidly, and it's sad what's happening, and it fits, though, with Bible prophecy. I'm hoping and I'm praying that God will give Donald Trump another four years because he holds on to to principles. He's no saint by any stretch of the imagination. But somehow God's put it in his mind and he's holding on to the principles that built America. But I will prophesy to you, I don't know if it'll happen in this next upcoming generation or not, but this country is going to go socialistic. And the young people are being suckered into it because they love to be told that they're going to be taken care of by the government. What they don't realize is they're going to be possessed. The government's going to tell them everything they can and cannot do. And the government control them to a point to where they just keep them just above poverty and just believing that things are going to get better and it never will. Just look at every country in the world that ever became socialistic. It's crazy for people to think socialism is going to help. But democracy is a short-lived government, and I'm confident that God put it in the mind of our fathers to develop a democratic style of government. But our forefathers never had in their mind the being able to take 
the Constitution of the United States and make it say with all the loopholes. The reason it's a short-lived type of government is because it has so many loopholes that you can get around almost anything. You can say the Constitution is saying anything. They won't change the Constitution. They'll just change what, how, their interpretation of it. And that's how they're going to change this country. And you're going to think, I mean, our young people are thinking we're going to get, you know, we're going to get taken care of medically. You know, they're going to do this. They're going to do that. They're taking rights away from you, and they're going to tell you, you know. But it's not a God. It's not God's government. It's, it's the government God gave this nation to restore his church. The United States is the, the nation that God has blessed more than any other nation in the world. That's just an absolute fact. Anybody that don't know that don't know nothing about history. Of the, you know, of, the, of the world since the United States started. So, uh, but this nation has turned on God. Of course, the Bible says anytime a nation turns on God, it'll be turned into hell, and this nation is becoming a hellish con in a hellish condition. So, but, anyway, I'm just showing you uh, this, this script. This scripture here, I'm just using it on harvest. Let me give you um, let me give you this scripture, and and since we're read there in Revelations, we'll just go ahead and look at Revelations 14. I'm getting at a point. I've got, there's a point that I'm I'm wanting y'all to get. I'll I'll clearly state it to you in here in a minute. But the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations. And in the sixth verse, it starts off, and I'm not going to read all this to you, but it starts off showing that there was an angel in the flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth in every nation and kindred and tongue and people. That's what I'm looking for. That's what this ministry is longing for is the everlasting gospel, the gospel that will last forever. If it's a lie, it won't last. If it's not true, it will not last. And we have to desire not what we want as doctrine. You know, this is, you know, you can think, well, this is what I believe and this is the way I want it to be. It don't matter how you or I want it to be. If it's different from the way it is, we need to get in a condition that God, I just want to understand the truth no matter what it is. And, you know, so please help me to get in a, a, a tender and humble enough condition that I can accept your truth and understand. And so uh, the, this, this ministry then has three messages. You all have heard me on it before. Fear God and give him glory. That don't sound like much, does it? I could talk on that for a week. We do not fear God near enough, nor do we give him proper glory. And that word fear, it does mean to be afraid of God, but it also means to re reverence him and to be in awe of him. But you ought to fear him, you know. You know, he gave Cain, and every, Cain every chance to just, I'm not going to accept your sacrifice. Just go. There is a sin offering an animal, go offer up the animal, the blood, like you're told to do. Cain wouldn't listen. It cost him his life before it was over with his soul. But God pleaded with him to do what was right. Um, so <clears throat> he didn't fear God. He didn't reverence him. He wasn't in awe of God, and he gave him no, no glory. He gloried in himself more than he gloried in God, and he gloried in what he wanted to do as far as offering a sacrifice, which was the wrong sacrifice. And so there's a lot to be said about giving God glory and fearing him. And, but if you, it, it does say in the seventh verse, for the hour of his judgment is come. That hour is a 15-year prophetical hour. That's the last prophetical hour, the seventh trumpet. 
And so <clears throat> that seventh trumpet, by the way, opens in the 11th chapter, and it goes all the way through the 22nd chapter. The... <clears throat> The seventh seal is opened in the eighth chapter, and that seventh seal is revealing everything that's in the Revelation, even that that's shown in the first six seals. Those first six seals are just indexes that gives a little synopsis of the book. The seventh seal is the book. It, it is everything that's in the indexes with all detail. From the eighth chapter, seventh seal to the end of the book. The last trumpet starts in the 11th chapter, and it goes to the end of the book. It's still part of the seventh seal. All the trumpets are in, all the trumpets are in the seventh seal, but the the <clears throat> the seventh trumpet is the finality. And look how important it is. The seventh trumpet is the first six trumpets are in the eighth, ninth, and tenth chapters. Three chapters. Seventh trumpet is in the 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Twelve chapters. Why? Because that's how important the information is in the last prophetical hour. And it's all the last 15 years. That's how important that information is. That the Lord himself spent 12 chapters of the entire book of, of Revelations to explain the seventh trumpet. That last hour is when this takes place in the seventh trumpet. Then, in verse 8, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So God's going to judge Babylon, which that's the same as a ministry that's going to cast the mountain into the sea. It's going to fall and be judged. Then the last... last uh, uh, the last message is, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in his hand, the same will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, <clears throat> I think it's very important to make note of the 13th verse where it says, And I heard a voice, now remember this is the last prophetical hour. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I've mentioned this before, but just notice that there is a greater blessing at the last trumpet, the last 15 years, that a person can die in the Lord more blessed I don't think that's a graveyard death. That is dying out to sin and ceasing from your labors. They rest from their labors. That's what we're all in. That's what we're all striving to do is quit doing our will and learn how to do the will of God. Now let me say something about that. <clears throat> that don't mean that God's just a God that just wants you. I'm the big boss and you're going to do what I tell you. That ain't how God is. God wants you to do His will because it's, it's what's righteous. He wants it to become your will. He just wants you to learn righteousness. But He's not saying, I want you to do every little jot until exactly like I'm telling you. No, that ain't how God is. God gave every one of us a, a fingerprint and an iris in our eyes that's different from anybody else's. Every one of us are individuals. God made us that way. You're an individual. And, and God wants you to be individually, individually a part of his kingdom just where his righteousness is working in you. The thing about it is not any one of us is big enough to do everything that God wants done. So it takes us corporately to be able to do Whatever's our gift and whatever our individual makeup is to be a part of the whole corporate body of Jesus Christ. He's not just wanting you to, he's not a big boss that way. In fact, he wants you 
to grow to a place that you are developed in righteousness, and whatever you do is going to be righteous. That's what he wants. That's his will. And your will needs to become that way. He still wants you to be you. He just wants you to be righteous what you do. So, I think there's a blessed time. Note that scripture. There's not another scripture in the Bible that, that that's that plain about that. And if you can be righteous and perfect and an overcomer at any time during any age, why would it be more blessed to die out to sin in the last prophetical hour? What would make it more blessed? Now, let me go on because that's not my main point. Verse 14 said, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set, up, set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. I want you to get that. When is the harvest? It's in the last prophetical hour, the seventh trumpet. That's when the harvest is. And that is when God's going to reap the earth in the end of the Gentile world. He reaped in the end of the Jewish world a harvest. What did Jesus say in John? Was it in John 5 where he said to his disciples, Say not. It's four months till the harvest. For he said the fields are white and ready to harvest. They must have thought, what's wrong with this guy? It was literally four months before the barley and wheat fields were going to come to full head and make grain. It's greener than the gourd. And he's telling them the fields are white. What he was telling them is, we're fixing to enter a harvest of the end of this world. And if you've got spiritual eyes, you can see it. The ripeness of this world is upon us. And that was, I know it was strange to them. I know they got it later, but they didn't get it right then. So... In the end of that world, there was a harvest. In the end of this world, there's a harvest. Now, let, let me go ahead and read you a little bit more here because there's another harvest you need to be aware of. Verse, of course, here, this Son of Man, a cloud, the clouds are restored church. The Son of Man, of course, is Christ. On his head, a golden crown. In other words, that's wisdom. Gold in the Bible is wisdom. Silver is understanding. Uh... He had, a, he had wisdom in his rulership. And in his hand, that's his ministry, a sharp sickle. That's the harvesting element, which is the ministry. Um, verse 16 says, he, set, he that sat on a cloud thrust in his sickle and the earth was, was reaped. And another angel, verse 17, came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and became blood out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. There, that's the harvest of the world when God's wrath is poured out. That takes place in a, a time of eternal judgment, which I'm going to be honest with you, saints. We're, you know, we're down in the end of the Gentile world. Uh, I won't put a time frame on it. You've heard me on it before, but but this world's getting critical. 
things are going to continue to happen like this coronavirus. God is going to drive people to their knees and they are going to humble themselves. And if they've got any, any confidence whatsoever in God, people are going to turn to God that have, that have you know, lived without serving God. But they're going to see their need in God before this is over with. And so these things are going to continue to happen. God, we're getting closer to God's judgment. His judgment's always existed in a measure, but we've never had eternal judgment. We haven't had judgment that causes you to be eternally judged where you're no longer worthy to be a part of God's kingdom. And that is going to happen. I mean, eventually God's patience will wear thin and God will judge this world. And what did Peter say? Judgment first must begin at the house of God. If God's going to use the church to judge the world, He certainly can't use an unrighteous church. So we have to suffer judgment. That just means that God, you know, y'all you know, have heard, heard this, that God's judgment first, it's informative, it's, investi it's investigative, God first instructs with his information. That's how his judgment works. It's not a bad judgment. It's good judgment, righteous judgment. God's going to give you instruction. He's going to give you information. He's not going to require of you till you get that. God will have to touch you for you to be worthy of his judgment. The, what, the, what Psalms 1 says, the ungodly are not so. They shall not stand in judgment. They won't be judged because they're already judged unworthy because they've never sought God and they've lived like an animal, like just doing their own will. But if we're going to serve God, we're going to have to say, God, teach me your judgment. Teach me righteousness. And for him to help us, he's going to have to instruct us and give us information. Then he'll require See, to him that, uh, how does that scripture say that? To him that knoweth, to, him that knoweth, that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it's sin. See, so you've got to know first what's sin. When God reveals it to you, then he's going to require you to, in other words, if you commit it, then now you know you have sinned. Now, some people are, you know, I've, I've met all kinds of people that are doing all kinds of crazy things. They have no idea that they're sinning. You know, their life, their behavior in this world is, is a behavior of sinfulness. But they don't know that because they don't have any information that they're convicted and know anything about their creator. So, um, so God... You know, he is going to judge, but first he's going to give you information. He's going to give you instruction. Then he will correct you. If you're humble enough to let God correct you, you know, Cain wasn't humble enough. He wouldn't be corrected. He was instructed, but he wouldn't take correction. And then even chastisement. If God loves you, Paul said, he chastises those whom he loves. Because he loves you. It's like a parent. You know, I sell dogs. Everybody, most people know me know I sell dogs. And I tell people this all the time. I say, if you're the kind of parent that don't believe in whipping a child, then you have no business with a dog. Because they have to be disciplined. They have to be trained. Just like children. I, I could turn it around. If you're the kind of parent that don't believe in discipline, whipping a child, you have no business with a child. I'm sorry if, I, if, I, if you don't like that. But it's just the way it is. The Bible says blueness of the wound drives the evil far from a child. Well, I hope you can get them trained up without having to give them a, a spanking that brings blueness, blueness <laughs> to the wound. I hope you can just, I hope they're humble enough that you can just correct them with, with stern, you know, discipline. But sometimes it takes a whipping. It works, you know. I wouldn't be my age today if my daddy hadn't gave me a few whippings. Probably, I probably wouldn't have made it. Anyway, this wine press, this is a judgment to the world. Okay, so 
Um, let's look in Ruth, the second chapter of Ruth, right quick. I want to hurry up because I do want to get through this. I don't want y'all to... This is an amazing little book because it's only, what, three chapters long and uh, four chapters long, and, and God wrote it over 2,500 years ago for the end of the Gentile world. Ruth was a Gentile. But in, in the second chapter, in the 23rd verse, it says, Ruth, it says, So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. This is just a story where there's a drought in Israel, a Limelech, a man by the name of Limelech and his wife, Naomi, moved to Moab because of their drought. And they had two sons, Malone and Kilion. And they married two women, Ruth and Orpah. And the boys, Daddy, Emelech, and the boys died while they were there in Moab. It's a picture. It's a picture of the early church ministry dying and even their descendants of the ministry dying. And, and the early church was left, but when Naomi heard that their God had visited the land, and she decided to go back to Israel, and that's a picture of the Gentiles from a uh, fallen away church going back, hearing, you have to hear that God's restoring the church. you got to hear that it's needful that the church be restored and that we have what the early church, New Testament, tells us that they had. We don't have it right now. Not all of it. We've got part of it. But we're seeking to get back and, and find what they had. That's what we're continually working for. And... And when she heard that God visited the land, in other words, the, the, the drought was over. And she went back to the land. When she went back to the land, guess what time of year it was? Harvest. And Ruth, you know, there was a law under, there was a law under Moses' law that if you were a poor person, that during the time of harvest, whoever owned the field and was harvesting could not harvest everything in the corners of the field. They had to leave the corners for the poor people. Ruth learned that. And you have to learn that. When you come to the body of Christ, you have to learn that God's made a way for you to glean the Word of God even though you have no real right to it. You come in as a stranger, but God gives you a right and allows you to glean of the harvest. That's a picture of the end of the world. And they, she, and, 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 and here's what she was told. She was told by Boaz, which is a picture of Christ. She was told by Naomi twice, don't you leave that field until the harvest is over. It was during the time of harvest, and y'all know the story. She harvested and gleaned in the corner of the field, and Boaz just kept giving her more and more. And finally, she wound up marrying Boaz, which is a picture of you and I, the Gentiles, can come back during the time of harvest that God's restoring his church and receive what the early church had and wind up in the bride of Jesus Christ. This is the thrust of my message on harvest. It happens in the last prophetical hour. It's, it proves out in scriptures. The types are all, all there. It happens in harvest time. Um, I could give you, there's a scripture in, in uh, Joel 3.13. Uh, 
Hosea, Joel. Joel 3.13. This links up with the scripture I gave you of the worldly harvest in Isaiah 4, I mean in Revelations 14, um, 14 and 19. And this scripture here in Joel 3.13. <clears throat> Let me back up just a little bit. It says, verse 11 says, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I set to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down. For the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. That's just during the harvest time. This is a picture and a prophecy. Joel, remember, this is talking about the end of the Jewish world, but it's, it's also paralytic. Is that a word? parallels with our time, the end of the Gentile world. So, um, it's, he's just showing that multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord. That's The day of the Lord is the, is the time of harvest or the last prophetical hour in both worlds. It's a big, it's a valley of decision. Because this world's going to see a manifestation of Jesus Christ in these latter days. And they're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to go with religion? Am I going to go with the beast and the mark of the beast? Or am I going to, and the image of the beast? Or am I going to go with the body of Christ? The beast and the mark of the beast is like socialism. It'll promise you everything and give you nothing. <laughs> Just remember I said that. But the, the body of Christ will tell you the truth. You're going to have to face righteousness. You have to face judgment. You have to, get, you have to quit sinning. Get sin out of your life and start living a righteous life. They're going to teach you. You can live any way you want to live. Just say your Hail Marys and your mother's full of, full of grace and heavenly fathers and all that. That will do nothing to make you righteous. And it won't do away with your sin. Uh, we're out of time. I can give you some more scriptures. I'll give you a couple to write down if you want. Uh, Joe, John 4.35 through 38 was a verse I was giving you on uh, say not it's four months to the harvest. Matthew 13, 39. It's talking about the end of the world. That's one that we, you really need to know about, the tares, the parable of the tares. Because, you remember, the tares, the husbandman said to the reapers, or, or to his workers, they came to him and said, somebody has sold tares in the field. Do you want us to pluck up these tares? He said, no, don't do that. Because you'll tear up the wheat when you do it. But wait till the end of the harvest. Wait till the end of the world. Then get the tares. Which is a, and bundle them up. That's going to be all of these organizations and all these groups that's going to join. They'll be bundled up in the image of the beast. They'll be bundled up and put in one system. Because judgment will go out and they'll reject the judgment and they'll run to the other. That'll bundle them up. They'll get judged first. Then God will judge his people. Then he'll judge Babylon. That's an important scripture. Proverbs 10 and 5, Proverbs 20 and 4. Those are main scriptures I'll give you. Mark 4, 29. It's on tape if you didn't get it. I said them fast, I know. I just wanted you to know the gist of what I'm saying, to understand that the harvest is not all the time. It's in the last prophetical hour. We're nearing that.
You want me to say it again? Mark 4, 29. Proverbs 10, 5. Proverbs 20 and 4. I gave you Matthew 13, 30. Matthew 9, 38 is another one. All right, God bless your hearts. Thank you for your attentiveness.